Uh, get things started. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Nick Nistico. I work for a premier beverage company. I'm here today to do a seminar on how to win cocktail competitions. What does that mean? For me, it's almost more importantly to learn how not to lose cocktail competitions first. And then from there, we'll progress into how to win them. My background is a bartender for many years. I worked in major cities, Miami, Philadelphia, New York, open great bars. I've had great mentors in our industry and people that have taught me so much that I've learned so much about competitions from. After a great streak of winning the majority of the great competitions we have in this world, uh, I now work for the distributor and I take great pleasure in going around and helping people like yourselves learn these little ins and outs that I wish somebody would have told me the first two years when I lost every competition until I actually got it figured out and you understand there's more of a formula behind this than you might think. So I urge you today to just open your minds, open your ears, ask questions. I'm going to curse a lot. I say things that go against the grain. I may down talk some brands and things like that. I don't give a fuck, right? Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah, you know? So we're going to go right into this here. Talk about competitions in general. So many different competitions flooding the market today. I remember when I started doing competitions, there were maybe four or five major competitions a year, and that was what you focused on. Now it feels like there's a different competition every other week, whether it's an online submission, a local competition, or a build-up that eventually gets into a larger scale competition. And the way that you perceive these competitions and choose to approach them is important for your career when choosing which competitions you're going to do, right? I always urge you to kind of map out. Think in the beginning of the year. I remember when I was doing these things initially, I would always look at it like a season, right? I grew up as an athlete, so everything was kind of building up to a season. And we would look at January 1st as when competition season would begin, and I always knew Bombay Sapphire was one of the first ones to come up. Then from there, I'd go into Legacy, and it would phase into these other ones. But I would kind of highlight those and make sure I was constantly working towards that competition with preparation. We're going to talk constantly about preparation today and how that is how you win competitions, right? Now, there's exceptions to every rule. There's people who show up for competitions every once in a while and you get lucky and you have a win. There's people who show up all the time and they lose, right? I've heard the statement before, winning is a habit. Unfortunately, so is losing. Couldn't be more true because with wins, you build what? Confidence. confidence. And confidence is fucking king when you are in cocktail competitions. If you think you're going to win, you can win. If you go and you think you're going to lose, you already lost. There's no point in you being there. Let me tell you how many guys I've watched over my career compete over and over and over and never win. You just settle into a rut where you're not showing up to win. You're showing up to compete. And that's a big difference. When you show up for your competition, you've got to ask yourself, am I showing up here today to win? Am I showing up here to compete? Am I showing up here to learn? Those are all different things. It's okay. When you first start doing competitions, you should be showing up and trying to learn. Assess what other people are doing, watch, analyze yourself, and see how you can get better from different things. So we're going to go right into the beginning of competition, which is entry. Think about how you enter into a competition. So some of these competitions, you have an online submission where you're going to fill out some bullshit questionnaire with all these different things it asks you. Then you submit that to a bunch of people you've never met before who analyze you as a bartender and determine if you're good enough to compete in this competition. I'll tell you a couple stories about that. I remember Woodford Reserve competition, the ultimate Manhattan competition for Esquire magazine. I entered in the state of Florida, received an email back a month later and said, hey, we apologize, but you did not make the cut. I was like, fuck, I was really looking forward to Woodford competition. I love Woodford. Great brand. I'm wearing a t-shirt today. So I was really disappointed about it. So I could have done a couple things. One, I could have went and pouted in the corner and said, oh, woe is me, I'm not going to compete, blah, 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 wait till next year. Maybe I could have badmouthed the brand a little bit or just went on to another competition. No. Instead, I went to my computer, I sat down, I wrote a kind email to the good people at Woodford Reserve, my local brand ambassador. And I was like, hi, my name's Nick, I work at this bar, we sell Woodford Reserve, I'm an enthusiast, I love the brand, really disappointed I didn't make the cut for the competition. If anything pops up, I would love to get involved if there's an opportunity. Thank you so much for your time. Two weeks later, I got an email. Hey, Nick, guess what? We got an extra spot in the competition for you. I went on and won the National Woodford Reserve title that year. Crazy. If I don't sit down and send that email, two weeks later, I never compete and win the regional and go on to the national. It never happens. So think about that when you send these online submissions. Sending an email is no big deal. It takes five minutes of your time, whether you get accepted or you don't. But guess what? 
learning how to not get accepted and send that email anyway, that gets you in the minds of whoever reads that email. You know, cancellations happen all the time in competitions. You secure 10 spots, eight people show up. You know, people get drunk the night before, they miss the competition. Be prepared up until that day and you can get right into it. So these online submissions, think about, I always say, think about the goals of the brands, right? Knowing the brand you're competing in, knowing the brand's goals, the portfolio, the distributor, all of these ins and outs. I can't preach these to you enough, okay? So let's say you're competing in a Bacardi competition, right? And it's in the state of Florida. You're gonna wanna know which distributor distributes Bacardi. It's gonna be Premier Beverage. From there, you would analyze Bacardi's portfolio, right? If I'm making, if I'm making a Bacardi cocktail and I'm putting a vermouth inside of it, I'm gonna use Martini Rossi or Noli Pratt. If you submit a Bacardi cocktail to get into the competition using Carpano Antica or Punta Mess, I don't care how far you think you're gonna go in the regional, you will not make it to the nationals. Bacardi will not put you on a stage on a grand scale where they're going to publicize things all over the internet using a competing brand that's not in their portfolio. Does that make sense? Yeah? Understanding the direction of the brand, right? I remember one year doing Bacardi Legacy when I wanted to use Bacardi Select inside of my cocktail. I wanted to do equal parts superior and Bacardi Select. Reach out to your brand ambassadors, your salespeople, and your local team and ask them, what's the brand's focus right now? What direction is the brand going in? I reached out and they're like, oh, Select? We're phasing out of Select. We're going to turn into Bacardi Black in two years. So it's not going to be around anymore. But what we are putting in, our, a, lot of, a lot of faith behind, is Bacardi Oak Heart. So I was like, okay. I ended up switching Oak Select for Oak Heart, putting it in. I won my regional. Just little things like that, knowing that. You think about these competitions and how they're built, knowing these brands and the portfolios and how they can help you, direction and focus. I think another one was Quantro. Did a Quantro competition. This is right when Remy V came out. Clear cognac, you guys familiar with that? Didn't really taste great to me, but figured, okay, I'm gonna use it inside the cocktail. It's gonna be insider information I'm gonna share with you guys. So I entered this Quantro competition and I make this cocktail. It was pre-batch and then served to the masses, judges walk around table format. So I batch the cocktail, Remy V, hibiscus. I got all these great ingredients inside of it and I taste it. And I'm like, oh, spot on, delicious. I didn't have any Cointreau inside of the cocktail yet. So me being the jerk that I am, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna wave the Cointreau and just serve it as is. Do you know that I won my regional for the Cointreau competition without a drop of Cointreau inside my cocktail? <laughs> First time I've ever said that out loud. <laughs> my friends and I laugh about it all the time. And we laugh about what a fucking joke this is most of the time. These judges, who is it, a blogger, some fucking foodie, you know, local guy, a chef. These people don't know the brands. They don't know what they're tasting. They're tasting a cocktail, right? So I'm not saying that's the way to do this. I'm just saying in your mind, think about how perception becomes reality for the cocktail. They didn't even have Cointreau inside of it. Like, how do you miss that? And then it'll go on and actually be successful. Incredible, incredible. Judges. Talk about the judges that are in these competitions. Do you think there's favoritism in cocktail competitions? You'd be an asshole if you thought otherwise, right? It's favoritism in life. I don't care where you go, what you do. People know people. Those people know other people. Find out who your judges are. Find out in advance, as far as you can. Send emails. You want to know who the judges are. You want to know scoring criteria. You want to scrutinize these details. Every little piece of them. When I'm competing in something and I know the judges, I will Google search those judges 15 times in a row. I'll call my friends that know their friends, find out where they went to school, what bars they worked at, what cocktails they've pioneered, what brands they've worked for in the past. I want to know everything about you by the time I get in front of you. And then I will use little things inside of that, right? Whether it's, I know you graduated from Florida State. And now when I drop cocktail napkins, all of a sudden yours is a Florida State napkin when everybody else is a regular napkin. It's a little detail that says, I gave a fuck more than the guy next to me who dropped four regular cocktail napkins, right? This is preparation in all forms. I've competed in very large competitions where there were judges who I didn't know, but I knew I had close friends who knew. And I would say, hey, do me a favor, you know, shoot your buddy a text message and just let him know I'm going to be competing in that competition in a couple weeks. Just hearing the name 
plants the seed in the mind, and now when you get up, you get additional attention that you may not have gotten before. Understand how this works? Right? Think about the competition the day of. You go, the judges are there. They're usually sitting, having a meal before. You usually see them walking around before the competition starts. Make your presence known. Not in the dweeby, obnoxious way where you go over and you're like, oh, hey, how you doing? I'm competing tonight. So nice to meet you. Here's my cocktail. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? What do you think? Keep it simple. Go over. Hi, here's who I am. Here's where I work. Great to see you. Thanks so much for coming out tonight. Short and sweet. Make your presence known. Now, when you go up in front of these judges, they're going to be, oh, there's the nice guy. There's the nice woman who introduced themselves to me before the competition started. There's 12 people competing. Two introduced themselves. You're instantly a shade above the rest. And it's about building these shades one by one to eventually give yourself an advantage over the competition. Right? These are cocktail competitions. And like I always say, great cocktails do not make great bartenders. Great bartenders make great fucking cocktails. Right? I can stand next to one person. We can make the exact same drink with the exact same recipe. Mine's going to be better because I'm going to will it to be better inside the shaker tin. And when I drop it, I'm going to drop it with more confidence. And whoever drinks it, that confidence is going to go across. We know how confidence works in life. When you're talking to someone, when you're selling something, trying to address someone, you know how this works? When you go and you're enthusiastic, if you guys missed it already, I'm very passionate about what I do. I fucking love training, learning, competitions in general. It's an opportunity to win. And if you want to compete, you got to want to win. If you don't want to win, keep competing so that your other peers can continue to beat you and we can continue to have competitions. It's like a full circle. Understand how that works? Right? So preparing to compete. So you go through all this preparation. You spend months, weeks studying, tasting recipes, building your story. Or maybe you don't. Maybe you show up and you wing it. Think about those two different methods. When you prepare, you have confidence. I was a cyclist for many years, a successful competing cyclist. And I always talk about preparation for cycling, how I would train so hard, day in and day out, proper diet, proper training, that when I got to the line, before the race started, I could look at my competition and know that guy did not work harder than me to get to this point. And that's confidence. And you can look at your competitor in the eyes and be like, today you will fucking lose. Because I have trained harder and I am more prepared and my cocktail is better. And you can convey that energy. I'm telling you, when I get on a hot streak, I won five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten competitions in a row. When I would walk in and show up, competitors' fucking faces would just drop. They'd be like, oh, we just lost the trip. We just lost that shitty bar toolkit that I'm going to throw in my closet and then give away to the upcoming bar back. Right? Like we said, those competitions before, think about what they are. You know you have the local competition where you could win you know, the $50 gift card and the $200 shitty bar toolkit inside the roll-up that you'll never use. And then the one where you could win a trip to a distillery or a trip to a major event. Select them along those lines. Think about how these things are going to be publicized. You want to go out there and win the national rum chata cocktail competition and find yourself on the Google search on the rum chata for the next 15 years of your career? I'm not knocking it, you know what I mean? Maybe I am, but hey, it's a different thing. You just got to think direction that you want to go in the cocktail world. Think about it. You eventually move on, you're working at a great bar, you want to get in something like Diageo World Class, and judges are on there and they're like, oh, who's this guy? And they Google him and there you are, mixing rum chata with Fireball on the internet. They're like, yeah, I don't know if this really fits the brand. Think about the end goal of the competition. Diageo World Class is a great example. Diageo World Class, in my opinion, is one giant interview to eventually be a brand ambassador for Diageo, which is how it works. Anybody who's ever won this competition continues to do brand work for a 12-month period of time under contract. Is that what you want? If it's not, then you shouldn't be in the competition. Maybe you work at a great bar. You've got a great owner. You're an assistant that's growing. They're going to open another bar. You're going to be the bar manager there. Maybe you want to own your own bar. Maybe you don't want to go work for Diageo for a year. So now you enter this competition with different grounds. You don't go in with intentions on winning the whole thing. And that hurts you in the long run. But at the same time, it can be learning experience because you go and you get exposure. Exposure is so important. I think of how many little things I've taken from cocktail competitions that I continue to utilize to this day. Different techniques, different approaches to things. 
Preparation. Let's talk about nerves. You guys get nervous? Who doesn't? <coughs> nerves are great, right? But they can go one of two ways. You can have nervous energy, which I have all the time. I love nervous energy. Right before you're getting ready to present, and you get that little feeling right here, and you're like, all right, it's getting ready to be time. It's getting ready to be time. And then you feed off of that. You're like, oh, there's my energy. There's my passion. It's what it is. I'm getting excited to convey my point, and I have confidence to go with that. And they're going to come together, and they're going to make me stronger. Or you have the worst type of nerves, nerves that eliminate talent. I'll tell you a story about nerves eliminating talent and favoritism at the same time. So Bacardi Legacy 2014. I show up in Puerto Rico for the global final. And from the minute we get there, there's this one guy from the Savoy cocktail bar named Chris Moore. Right? Works at the Savoy in London. We know Bacardi loves the Savoy and they would love to get somebody from that bar to win their global cocktail competition. This guy's walking around in a three-piece suit by the pool. I shit you not. And the guys from Miami were like, what the fuck is this guy doing? Three Every time I see him, he had a different three-piece suit on. Out there schmoozing the judges. When all the photographers show up, it was always like he got more photographs than everyone else. And we're like, wow, is this thing kind of being swayed towards uh, Chris Moore winning this? It happens, okay? And you can bet your ass that Bacardi wanted Chris Moore to win that year. And we all knew it. You can take that one of two ways. Go pout in the corner. Oh, I'm not the guy. Or you can get angry about it. Makes me angry. Still thinking about it till today. So Chris Moore walked around in this three-piece suits for three days. Showed up competition day. Makes it down to the final eight. Goes up on stage and forgets to put Bacardi in his cocktail. On the stage at the global final wearing another three-piece suit. We're sitting there in the front row elbowing each other like he forgot the fucking Bacardi. He forgot the fucking Bacardi. I hope he doesn't remember. Forgot it. Forgot it. Lost. Literally was cut out for him to win, and he knew it. It was the most difficult loss. I felt bad for him in the end because I was like, you know what? You came here. You were groomed to win this. You had everything going for you. Next year, Tom Walker from the Savoy won Bacardi Legacy, who again was groomed for this competition. The year that I won, they groomed another guy to win. His name was Steve Schneider. I show up. Here we go again. Steve's there in his chef coat. All the cameras are around him. I'm like, wow, this is great. At least I don't have any hype. I'm over here in the corner. Nobody's bothering me. Where this guy's, you know, pretty much signing autographs and holding the trophy as we're getting ready to compete. And I'm like, fuck. Fucking, you know, this guy's all over the TV. He's all over the internet. How am I going to win today? What am I going to do? You get angry about it. it. Starts to motivate you. I beat Steve Schneider that day and won Bacardi Legacy. It's one of the best wins that I had because he had beaten me before at 42 below. And I didn't like it. When you lose, you shouldn't be happy about it. People are like, oh, I lost, no big deal. You, fuck, it should be a big deal. If it's not a big deal, why'd you compete? You lost, so you don't care? Oh, we'll go home, we'll do better next time. I hope so. Don't you want to do better? Right? When you lose, you should be upset about it. And again, two types of upset. Do you want to go pout, or do you want to get better? Do you want to look and analyze what you did wrong, or do you want to find out how you can make those things better? So you think about those two guys that were groomed, don't let that affect you when you show up for the competitions and you have guys that are so much more experienced. So when you start making excuses right off the bat, oh, it's only my second competition. Oh, I work in a bar where we don't make cocktails. Who the fuck? Do you have guests? Do you make people happy? Do you satisfy people? Do you create experiences? That's what you're doing at a cocktail competition. Making the drink is the easiest part. The easiest part. I watch people spend two months figuring out a recipe. The recipe. Build your story. The recipe you'll find along that story. Does that make sense to you? If you're thinking about your legacy, I always preach Bacardi Legacy is a competition that's structured around you. It's not your recipe, right? The recipe is fucking background noise. You're going to find that recipe when you're looking at your legacy, where you're from, what you did, how you got to that point. Same thing when you're designing any signature cocktail for a competition. Think about what that cocktail means to you, what ingredients you want to use, and then it'll all come together. And you'll figure it out along those lines. Simplicity wins these things, right? Now, unless you're doing something like GQ Most Imaginative, where obviously they're looking for cocktails that are out of the box, take that into consideration. 
ask details about where this cocktail is going to go. I knew for Bacardi that when we won, that cocktail would have to be pre-batched nationwide for the rest of the year for every Bacardi event. It was a pre-batched cocktail. One year when I lost, a Japanese guy named Shingo Gokan won. I'll tell you about nerves. So I show up for that legacy, and I have my mentor is in. It's a guy named John Lemaire, you guys may know. So right before the competition, John knows all the judges. They're all shaking hands. I'm like, oh, here we go. They want him to win. He's in the back. He's opening a can and slices his lip open on the can five minutes before Bacardi Legacy National, and he's gushing blood from his lip. He's like, what am I going to do? <laughs> so he goes up to the judges. Would you imagine that they allowed someone else to make the cocktail for him using his recipe, and he finished third place somehow? Shingo Gokan goes up. This is another thing about nerves. Think about when you go to the competition, do you want to watch the people before you? That's all a preference thing. You know, I would find myself standing there watching everybody go right before me. Oh, let's see what this guy's going to do. Let me see what he's going to do. Then you see somebody do something really good, and you're like, oh, there goes that confidence that I had 15 minutes ago. Now I'm going to go up here and lose. Or if you're in the back and you never see it, it never happened. You grew up with the same confidence. So I developed that technique over time. Now, when I used to compete, I would be in the back in the prep room with my headphones on, reading my notes, focusing on what I need to do to win. Not what that person needs to do to lose. Finding out what they're going to do. I don't give a shit. It doesn't matter to me. It's all about what I'm going to do. Think about your preparation when you show up. I would get sweat stains on my shirts. I watch guys that compete with gray collar shirts consistently and have armpit sweat rings like this. Like, bro, buy a white shirt. You know, like you, you know your armpits are going to sweat. We're all men. We know how this goes. Don't show up in the gray shirt. It's like when you go out on the first date. Do you wear the tight blue shirt where you know you're going to sweat and get rings on? No. No. Develop another technique over time. I would bring all my clothes and put them in a bag and walk around the t-shirt until it was one guy before me. Then I would go in the restroom and get dressed and come out and feel fresh as a daisy, like I just got out of the shower, with a fresh press shirt on. Not the shirt, vest, and tie that I've been walking around in for the past three hours, sweating, stressing, now it's wrinkled. Maybe I broke the button on the vest, and I look like shit. After I got this all pressed for the competition, it was a waste of my time. Should have shown up in one outfit, then switched into another. Again, this is a preference thing, and you will learn this over time when you learn yourself, how you react to nerves. I fought shaky jigger hand for two years of shaky jigger hand at competitions. This is an uphill battle. And then I realized over time why this happened. It was because when I get nervous, I'm less inclined to eat, right? So when I wake up in the morning and I have a competition, I'm like, oh shit, I'm so nervous. I don't really sit down and enjoy a meal like I should, right? Then you spend the next four hours stressing out. By the time you get the jigger in your hand in front of the judges, you're like this. I, don't, I never shake like this. I don't understand why. Yeah, because you don't usually famish yourself before you go to work, you know, and you're not nervous. So think about that. For me, I understood that two hours before a competition, I needed to sit down and eat a good meal to stabilize my body. And then I knew that after one shot of tequila, I was in the prime zone, ready to go. Some people takes two, some people takes three shots. Whatever works for you, you will learn. But if you don't try to learn, you never will. You will have shaky hand for the rest of your fucking competing career. It's not what you want. You gotta figure out what's causing the problem and then attack it. Don't focus on your strengths, focus on your weaknesses. Right? I know that when I present, I'm a great speaker. This is one of my strengths when I do cocktail competitions. Right? It wasn't always that way. There was a time when I struggled to put all my thoughts together and let them come full circle. It's what we call open-ended thoughts when you're giving a presentation. It's where you make a statement and then you don't close it out by tying it together with something else. Give an example. You're talking about a cocktail and you're like, you know, I really like this cocktail because it reminds me of my friends and family in New Jersey in the holiday season. And I'm going to put Bacardi inside of it and then mix it with maple syrup. Like, what was the point of that story? You never tied it in to some part of your cocktail so fundamental to say, think before you talk, right? I function on bullet points. Again, this is knowing yourself. I worked with people that come from musician careers, or maybe they were ballerinas, or going to go as a ballerina, 
and she would map out her every single movement for a competition. Like it was like the bottle starts here. I'm going to pour it here and then put it here after and literally have a set list of moves to get through your cocktail. Sounds great in theory until this falls over here and now you're like, what do I do? I've been practicing the same thing for the past three months. Now this fell and I don't know how to recover. Recovery is the key to good competitions. I can tell you two competitions in particular I can remember. One for Bacardi where I went to sh break the tin for my second set of cocktails. And when I went to crack the tin, I dropped the entire drink in the ice well. Luckily, I had two minutes to spare. And instead of staring at it, like, I immediately picked the tin up and began to build the other cocktail. The timing for the competition, if you have eight minutes to compete, structure your presentation for five minutes. Not for seven minutes and 30 seconds. You're not giving yourself a good window there. Does that make sense? Right? Plan on something going the wrong way. And then when it doesn't, the, the competitions that I've won the best, I can tell you that when I finished my presentation and walked over to the clock, I had two minutes to spare and closed it out hard. The guys who win are not the people that get the garnish on at the last second and get it up on the table. You don't see people win like that. It's the one who gets that cocktail down with confidence and you have time to spare. And you're like, all right, there we go. I timed myself perfectly. Another competition I did, I was straining the last drink, and when I went to do my wrist snap, I knocked one of the glasses right over on the side. I immediately looked at the side judge, and I was like, how much time? And he was like, two minutes and 30 seconds. I was like, boom, no problem. Take that glass, rinse it out, ice it, made an entire another cocktail, and still had another 40 seconds to spare. Not panicking. Sounds so simple to sit here and say this to you. Don't panic when it happens. Right? But it's going to take something to happen before you understand. You got to learn from your mistakes. We always say smart people learn from their own mistakes. Wise people learn from the mistakes of others. Right? See, the one guy that makes the mistake, you don't let it happen to yourself. So talk about your tools and everything you have set up. When you go to a competition, Bring as much with you as you can. I'll tell you two things I always bring with me. Simple syrup and lime juice. Right? Do you think I trust your bar back, who I don't know, to juice my lime juice and put it in some fuck shitty plastic squeeze bottle that could have been sitting in the back of the fridge for four days before I got there? Happens all the time. All the time. Simple syrup. <laughs> Let me tell you about when the bar back comes in stoned and he thinks 50-50 is 40-50. Or two to one, it's one to one. Happens all the time. When I, my, my simple syrup in particular, I do it equal parts by weight, which is real specific for me. So if I go to your bar and you're eyeing up your simple syrup, if I spec my cocktail out and practice it for months, it's going to taste different when I get there. Bring those things you cannot. I would rather bring bottles that I never use. Better to be the need to have and not need than need and not have. God, can't tell you how important. Bring all your own shaker. I watch guys show up without tools for competitions. Hey, can I borrow an extra shaker tin if I'm competing against you? Absolutely you can. Why not? Always be that person. Don't, I'm the biggest jerk out there, believe me. But I'm not jerk enough to not loan you my bar tools. I'll even let you use my lime juice for my simple syrup. I'm a nice guy. Because when I beat you, I want you to be at your best. I don't want you to be excusing later on and be like, man, I maybe could have won if I had that same lime juice that Nick had. Oh, no, no. You can use it, too. You can juice your own limes as well, and you can come with all your equipment ready to go. Yes? What about ice? Ice. So these are things you've got to ask. Ask before, right? And ask when you're alone so that the other people don't know you're asking. Ask via email. Hey, what is it okay for me to bring? Some of these things are wide. It's like the Wild West. It's wide open. You bring whatever you want. Nobody can bring ice, bring glasses, strainers, straws, napkins. I'll bring an entire bar set up. I work on a cutting board or a silver tray when I work. It's one of those two things. So when I compete, if I have the option, I will bring with me my silver tray or my cutting board. It makes me feel comfortable. I get to the station, and no matter what well it is, at what bar it is, I look down and I'm like, oh man, there's my trusty silver tray that I build drinks on every single day. I immediately have a sense of comfort that comes over me, and I know that I have what I need to be successful right there. Right? Same thing with your tools. Bring the right tools that make you feel comfortable. 
If you get there and they don't have what you want, don't hesitate to ask. I talk about when you go to a bar and they keep the eggs on top of the bar with no, you know, nothing inside. The eggs are just getting room temperature. And then you're expected to make some type of sour cocktail on call. Be the guy that asks for fresh eggs. Hey, would you mind going to the walk-in and just get me some fresh eggs? I don't have to use these ones. I've been sitting here all day. Be the guy that asks for fresh ice in the well. I routinely, if I'm doing a bar competition at someone else's bar, I always tip the bar back. Right? Pro tip, let me tell you what 20 bucks does for the bar back when you show up for the competition. Having a competition at your bar, you ever have one at your bar? Where people come to your bar and fuck up all your stuff? And your bar back is like, oh shit, it's a competition today, here we go. I'm gonna spend my day cleaning up after 10 jerks who come here. They're gonna steal all our tools, they're gonna use all our liqueurs. I'm OCD. Just watching people touch bottles gives me anxiety with thumbprints. Right? When you go in, you see the bar back, and you're like, hey, bro, how's it going? My name is Nick. I'm here for the competition today. I'm going to leave your stuff just the way I found it. Here's 20 bucks for you. I appreciate your time today. That guy is in your pocket for the rest of the day. Can you get me a cucumber? No problem. Can you get me a knife, a cutting board, a couple of glasses, three linens, a white towel, a glass of water? These are all things I may need, right, that that person's going to be more inclined to get for you as opposed to the, yeah, and then I walk away, and then you don't see that guy again for a little while. You know how that works? Right? So be that person who engages the people when you get there. Know the account. Know where you're going. If I'm competing at a bar, I'll go in for dinner the night before. Or go in and get cocktails in the week leading up. Show my face. Don't walk in and be the stranger at the account who's going to be competing, who's going to do all these things, and nobody knows who you are. Right? Does that make sense to you guys? Everybody with me? Questions, comments, concerns so far? No? We're taking things away from this? Do you feel good? Are you guys feeling more confident as we sit here? That's how it should be. I want you to show up for your next competition and feel more confident. Feel like you have a chance to win, right? Let me tell you about studying things on YouTube. I've fixed my dryer. I changed my oil. I fixed parts of my bike from watching YouTube. It's incredible. You can learn so many things about bartending by watching YouTube, right? One little thing from the way a guy holds a jigger or one little technique from the way a guy holds a shaker tin can change your style. You think about originality and cocktail styles, people who shake a tin a specific way, right? None of these things are really original. Everything is an adaptation of somebody else's technique at this point. You take a little bit from this guy, a little bit from this guy, you mix it with your own technique, and you created something new. Same thing with our cocktails and things that we're developing now. It's looking at different ideas and then making them your own. Do that. This is part of your R&D, your research and development your preparation, studying all of these things. Know the brands inside and out. I can't stress to you enough. Know, are they pot stilled? Are they column stilled? What are they made from? How long is fermentation? Have these little tidbits and just kind of salt and pepper them over your presentation. You know, I remember doing Diplomatico and using the, uh, the silver tequila, Diplomatico, the, the Blanco, which is 50-50 column and pot, then they filter it, they charcoal filter it so it comes out clear, right? Throwing that in the competition. It's actually 50-50 column and pot. I mean, you throw that in there, and if there's somebody from the brand, they're like, wow, that tells me you went on the internet or you spoke with someone and took in an extra tidbit. These competitions nowadays are close. The competition is getting better and better, and we have more exposure to education and resources. And if you're not exposing yourself to those things, you're losing. You're falling behind the competition. You gotta expose yourself to as much as possible so that when you get there, you are overly prepared. And being overly prepared is gonna build your confidence, right? And when you're overly prepared and you show up and you're nervous, it's like test day. You study so much for the test and then the test drops and you look at it and you're like, I don't know any of this. It's because you're nervous. You do know it. You've been studying it for days. Take three deep breaths, another shot of tequila, and hope that it comes to you. And it will. You just gotta relax going into these things. Think about your attire and how you present yourself, right? I think about how I was competing in Bombay Sapphire one year, and a buddy of mine, Trevor was his name. I won't say his last name. There's a lot of Trevors out there. This fucking guy shows up, and his ass cracks hanging out of his jeans. He's got a wrinkled shirt. His jeans are faded with holes inside of him. Just looks like shit. And I'm sitting there in a perfectly pressed vest tie, and I'm looking at this guy and I'm like, 
Do you think in your mind when you left the house today that Bombay Sapphire and their wildest fucking dreams would put you on a GQ magazine? I don't care if you make the best cocktail in the history of the world. You have to know how these competitions are going to work. Think about how they're structured. What is the end goal? Do they want you to win and they want to put you out there? Do you want to be in ads? Are you going to be in videos? Are they going to send you around to do different seminars? Are you that person that they're looking for? We're not all that person. If you're not, you don't compete in that competition. Look for competitions that are structured for you. If you're very fast and efficient and you're a female, look at Speed Rack. Makes perfect sense. If you make cocktails with out-of-the-box ingredients, my cocktails are usually vegetable-based. Right? I've won global competitions using sugar snap peas, broccoli, red bell pepper, arugula. Right? Just because I came up at a time when every competition, every bartender was doing a stirred cocktail with maraschino liqueur, chartreuse, or one of these things right there. That was, it was that time period. You know? Oh, I'm going to rinse my glass in chartreuse and stir something with maraschino and call it a day. And people did well with that. Where when you're looking to separate yourself, think about that. What can I do to separate myself from the other competition here, but still stay relevant and be in the box where it's capable for somebody else to reproduce? Can somebody else reproduce my cocktail? Is it that nine part syrup that I made at home in the kitchen using all these exotic ingredients that I got from five different stores that I myself could not recreate come tomorrow? And now I'm gonna put that into the cocktail? <sighs> Nightmare. If you're fortunate enough to eventually progress and get to the global level of competition, where you will be traveling outside of your country, which I gotta tell you is one of the greatest feelings in the entire world. When you're on a grand stage and it's your flag in the background and there's guys from other countries and you're sitting around a table and they're like representing the United States of America. You look around and you're like, I'm rep representing the United States of America? The jerk off bartender from Miami? It's like a joke. And you go up and put a smile on your face and you realize you are representing. Not just yourself, but your USBG chapter, your peers, your bar. The biggest resource you have are your coworkers, right? You know the person who tastes every drink and they're like, oh, this is good. That person's not a resource for you. They don't know what's good. The person who tastes your drink and says, that doesn't taste very good, it's off balance, and that garnish looks like shit. That's your friend. That's the person who's gonna help your cocktail get better. If you work in cocktail bars, it's no coincidence that the guys that consistently win the bigger competitions come from better bar programs. Does that make sense? I have five other palettes and technicians that I'm working with who are constantly analyzing what I'm doing, my cocktail, my skill level, and then helping me improve. If you don't know those people, try to surround yourself with them. You've got to surround yourself with people who you want to learn from and be better from. I spent a large part of my career jumping from bar to bar to bar because I would eventually find myself in a teaching position at a bar where I'd be working with a bunch of younger bartenders and every six months I would be like, man, I'm, I didn't learn anything in the past six months that was really substantial or something I'm going to keep with me. And I would go and look for more people that knew more than me, that knew different things, guys that were specialists in their field, guys that are specialists in just ice, guys that are great with just juice, they can't all make balanced cocktails. But if you can take something from all of them and make it your own, that's going to become your style. Persistence. When I started competing, I shit you not, I'm telling you, for two years, I lost every cocktail competition that I competed in. Two fucking years of misery. In my opinion, I had the best cocktail every single time. But that's how I always feel. That's how you should feel when you show up. Right? But then you start to realize about all those things that I just built up to get to here and how you need to separate yourself, dress the part, know your brands, know your portfolios. I was speaking with Lynn House from Palma before this, I was telling her about this. We were talking about an online submission that she's doing for, uh, for Heaven Hill, where people are submitting cocktails for Heaven Hill for their competition. People are putting bullet whiskey with Palma liqueur. What are you, a moron? Like you think Heaven Hill's gonna put bullet in a cocktail to compete in their, co like it, it never ceases to amaze me that people will continue to do this. Utilize the portfolio. If you don't know it, you gotta learn it. You will not win. You will not. I don't care what you do. You don't wanna be the guy at the end where the judge comes over and he's like, man, you could have won, but just didn't use our vermouth. Oh, that's a tough loss right there. Now you go home and you're like, shit. 
was that close. All I had to do was look up the portfolio and learn a little bit, little bit more about it, and it would have been so much better, right? Again, guys, to kind of close this out for us, think about this. Winners will continue to win. And winning is not just cocktail competitions. It's every single day. It's in a lifestyle, and it becomes that habit, right? If I'm playing rock, paper, scissor with the fucking bartender over who's going to get cut first, God, I want to win. If I show up for the cocktail competition, it's an opportunity for me to go to some amazing distillery and get an experience. Remember, my friend told me when I was young, John Lemaire, one of my mentors, told me. He realized that I was a good speaker and that I could be good at this, and I didn't really know shit about cocktails. And he was like, listen, you do these cocktail competitions, you can travel the world getting wasted on premium spirits on other people's dime. And I was like, wow, that sounds, that sounds really good, John. How do I do that? He's like, all you got to do is research into these competitions. And it's going to, guess what? It's going to make you a better bartender while you're doing it. You're going to have exposure to all these different things around the world. I can't tell you how true that has been for my career, how winning cocktail competitions, what that has done for me. For me, when I was competing, it was about getting exposure. That was my end goal, promoting myself as a brand, which I can then go out and use to get work to make money. I didn't compete for glory. I was financially motivated at the time. I wanted knowledge. I wanted better skill set. And I wanted to get a better job. And you'd be shocked how when you win one of these things, all of a sudden your name's out there. Let's talk about losing a cocktail competition. How to lose. Well, the first two years that I lost, I would get in the car and punch the steering wheel. I would curse people out on the way out the door. Maybe tell the brand ambassador to go fuck himself on my way home. Right? Remember a good friend of mine, Isaac Grio. You guys know Isaac Grio? Great guy. He competes at a Woodford Reserve competition. He loses. He felt like he had the best drink. Goes over and chews out the brand ambassador. He's like, I'm never carrying Woodford at my bar again. I'm like, Isaac, what are you, what are you doing? You know, he's, six months later, I, I'm working for that brand. And the brand's like, hey, I need a bartender for a three-day gig, 800 bucks a day. Do you have anybody in mind? I'm like, yeah, uh, Isaac Grio. You heard of him? <sighs> yeah, we don't want to work with him. Uh, he told me to go fuck myself after that cocktail competition. <laughs> Isaac, way to lose 2,400 bucks. Just like that. God, it's the hardest thing, especially when you're so competitive. Like I said, when I lose, it is like, God, it will eat me up inside. But you've got to have... Enough, enough to muster yourself and go over and shake the hand, say congratulations, you did a great job, and then go over and thank the judges for their time, find the people from the brands, seek them out and say thank you for the opportunity to be here. I look forward to competing again next year. If you have any event work in the future, give me your business card. And don't just take that business card and throw it away. Probably the biggest thing that I see in this industry is lack of follow-up with business cards. Let me tell you about that. Tell you how much money I've made by sending an email from a business card. Lots of money. From getting cards from brand ambassadors and going back home and sending an email. Great meeting you today. Want to let you know I live in the Miami area. If you ever need a bartender for a brand event, I'm your guy. God, I need bartenders for brand events all the time. I got a core group of people that I use because they're reliable. And those are the people. Now think about how that works. You do a bunch of brand work for a brand. You're their guy who's out doing all these promotions. And then that brand's competition comes up and you're in it. And the guy who's been at all those events is one of the judges. Do you think you have a shade above the competition? You bet your ass you do. And that's part of preparation that leads up to this. It's all those little things that tie into the whole and will make you better at competing. But if you want to be good guys, you got to want to be good. And if you don't want to be good, you're going to stay the same. And like I said, I encourage it because that's more people to beat out there. Right? The world needs ditch diggers too. I say it all the time. But if you get out there and you want to win, you can be winners. I want to thank you guys so much for your time this morning. I appreciate it so much coming out here for Repeal Day. This is awesome.